next up we have Doug Jordan. Yep. The other Jordan. The other Jordan, no relation. <laughs> um, who's going to be telling us about uh, Teledyne detectors? Yeah, some CMOS. Okay, so uh, as we were saying, Paul is right there. It's spelt differently, no relation. Um, so I'm briefly going to be going through um, Teledyne's visible sensors. Um, so a lot of you in the room will probably have heard of E2V. We are now Teledyne E2V. Um, and as such, I will also talk a bit about our IR sensors that we get through our, our colleagues in the States. Um, so by way of introduction, I'll go through a few CCDs for astronomy, some CCD systems. Um, yes, we put up a, a nice image of JPAS earlier. Um, some CMOS devices and... Then I'll, I'll move in a little bit to enhanced red sensitivity. So you might have heard a few of a few sensors that that are on LSST, Euclid, etc., where there's a higher red sensitivity. Um, I'm not going to be talking about EMCCDs in space. Unfortunately, I've taken that out. Um, but then I'll go through a bit of infrared um, devices. So by way of introduction, we've got quite a lot of well used. Um, custom, large area CCDs, um, they're all very high sensitivity, um, so it's custom ones in quite a few um, telescopes around the world, pretty much all the major telescopes have e, uh, E2V EM CCDs, quite a lot of them have EM CCDs, and hopefully a few more will have CMOS in the future. Um, we have multiple standard and custom CMOS sensors, again for ground based and space use. Um, and as we were talking about earlier, um, these have several advantages over CCDs. They, they use the same back thinning process, the same material, so the sensitivity is exactly the same, pretty much. Um, but they can have a higher frame rate, we can have smaller pixels, we can integrate a lot of functionality into it, um, so you need less support equipment around it. Um, and I'll go through some high red sensitivities, um, both on CCD, where it's well developed now and is, is being used on quite a few systems and, and moving forward into high red sensitivity of CMOS, which again Jesper mentioned very briefly. Um, and then moving on to our American colleagues, Mercad TEL sensors, um, and I'll show you a few of those. So, brief overview of some of our sensors. Um, probably the most interesting one at the moment is the 290, which is being used on uh, JPAS, um, and that's a standard sensor that anybody can come and buy, please do. Um, it's a 9K sensor, so it's pretty much a whole wafer sensor. It's as large as we can get on our 6-inch fab. Um, and there's a couple of other sensors, the 231C6s. Um, moving down to the 220, which, as we've already talked about, is heavily used for um, AO. Um, I should note the previous EMCCD was the 201, the... Um, you previously showed rather than the 220, but easily confused. So the 201 is 1K by 1K, the 220 is um, 240 by 240. They're at a very similar speed, so as you've got fewer pixels on the 220, it runs a lot quicker, and then you can use it for higher frame rate imaging. Um, and also of, a, of note is the CCD 250, um, which is a significantly <coughs> thicker device, and, because, and as it's thicker, it has a greater sensitivity to um, near infrared. So the JPAS CryoCam. So this is a this is a system that we've built. You, you, you may have heard that we've, we've done a lot of CCDs, a lot of CMOS, but this is a full system. So this is including the, uh, the focal plane with all the CCDs in it. Um, there are 14 science um, 290 detectors, so we made a, quite a few batches to get a high yield on those ones. Um, some guide sensors, wavefront sensors, in a custom-built cry cryogenic chamber with its own electronics, um, and it's incredibly flat. It's been measured um, at, at, at cryogenic temperature to, to within 27 microns across the entire array, um, and it still is, fortunately. It's, it's gone all the way up the mountain, and it still is that good, which is fantastic. Um, so moving on a bit to some CMOS. So... Um, this is this is a, a, a quite interesting sensor. It it you don't tend to use all of it at the same time. It, it 
Because CMOS, you can reference small portions of a device. On this device, you can, you can ask for, I want a, a small frame in this area, and a small frame in that area, and a small frame in that area. So you only read out the bits that you're interested in. Um, and you can do that at a very high speed. So 20 frames per second with Windows readout. So we've got 1,000 windows that you can reference on this, reading them all out at the same time at 20 frames a second. Um, it's a 2K by 4K device, but yeah, you can use as much of it as you wish. Um, so it has quite a lot of potential for, for um, both ground-based and space applications. Um, it's currently being used <coughs> on the Teos project. Um, so yeah, we can, and also it's three side buttable, so you can put it in, in arrays. So, as I said, there's some specs from it. Um, two gate by four K. Um, the noise is is pretty good. So at, at three electrons uh, per channel, um, and the dark signal is pretty low, and the frame rate is basically whatever you wish it to be, um, because you can read out a small region of interest. LVSM, so this is the next step in um, AO sensors. So it's being built in development with uh, ESO, um, and it's going to be used on the, uh, the ELT. So this is a large area device, and it's got windowed readouts again, but each of those windows we can run at a different gain, um, and it's, it's currently in characterization. So, this is one of the first images of this device built. So it's, we've, we've had it for about a month or so now. Um, it is imaging, and we're still, still doing, doing characterization on it. Um, so it's 800 by 800 pixels, and there's 80 by 80 sub-apertures of 10 by 10 pixels each. Each of those, um, can have a different gain so you can have the best signal to noise ratio of that particular part of the wavefront that you're looking at. Um, it can run, or well, the goal is a, a thousand frames a second, but I think, I think the spec is 700. Um, and it's inbuilt into a Peltier pack, so this has its own cooling. Um, and yeah, we're running at, at minus 10. So it's got on-chip ADCs, so it gives digital output, so you don't need all the support equipment that you might have normally had for a CCD. Um, and so it, it, the complexity in terms of what you need to drive and run these things significantly falls when you move to CMOS. So this is the SIS120. This is the one that Jesper was talking about. Um, I've probably got a slightly nicer picture. Um, but this is in the NGSD package, so this was the precursor to LVSM. It's just a convenient package. So ignore how hideously <coughs> large that package is. It was just a convenient one that we had. Um, and I have no idea why the window, window is so thick. Um, so this has been designed to just be an easy to use, fully digital, general purpose, back illuminated um, CMOS detector for a whole wide range of applications. Um, so it is built with with um, the ability to run in space, so it should have decent um, um, SEU and latch-up in immunity. Um, so we're currently on version B of this, and we shall be, um, well, Jesper's got some samples. He's a very lucky man, because uh, not many other people have at the moment. Um, so in, you, yes, you have Rev A samples. That, there's a few issues with those. Um, so it's a 2K by 2K sensor, a 10 micron pixel. Um, charge capacity is about 30 to 40 kiloelectrons per pixel. Um, and essentially, the most important thing about this is that it is it's able to do most of the heavy lifting for you. It's a CMOS sensor. You don't need to have a sequencer. You don't need to have a digitizer. You don't need to have all the other stuff around it. You just say, I want an image, and it gives you a digital image. And you can select the bits, um, the amount of bits and the ADC resolution that you want. So from 8, 10, 12, 14, and that will change your frame rate. So you, essentially, you can use it in a lot of different ways. It uses very conventional power supplies. Um, so yeah, the idea is that we can put arrays of these together, um, and you can do whatever you want with them, which is nice. 
So moving on to enhanced red sensitivity. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the LSST device is, is quite thick. Um, and if you look at this um, diagram here, so this is quantum efficiency on the uh, y-axis and wavelength along the x. Um, so we're just looking at the optical, for, optical wavelengths here. And as you move to higher sensitivity um, on the right-hand side, going up towards near-infrared, that's you're getting thicker silicon. So um, we were talking about uh, brighter, fatter effect earlier as well. Um, so that only really comes in when you start going to significantly thicker silicon than your pixel size. Um, so this does have some, some downsides to it. Uh, the PSF isn't quite as good as you go thicker, um, but your rent sensitivity basically goes up almost linearly with the amount of silicon that you've got because such a small amount of it is absorbed. Um, so we have quite a few different sensors of these, and they, they, they tend to work quite well. So there's the 261, there's the 250. Um, there's also a, a variant of the 231, um, which is deep depleted, so it is thicker. Um, and there's the Euclid sensors that are currently up in space. Um, well, soon to be in space. I can't remember if it's launched yet. I don't know. Soon to be, yeah. Um, so we, we have a mature technology for... CCDs, but we do not have a mature technology for CMOS at the moment in terms of getting that enhanced red sensitivity. Um, but thanks to our collaboration with the Open University and, um, and Konstantin Stefanov there, he came up with a great idea to build thicker, fully depleted CMOS sensors. Um, so having all those advantages from the digital readout and the high speed of, of CMOS sensors, but also the advantage of that we can make it really thick. So one of the aims, I think later this year, is we'll have some of the first sensors using this technology. I think we based on it on a CIS 120. Um, so yeah, keep, keep, your, keep your ears close to the ground. We'll see what we can do on those. Um, CCD 250. So this is, the, this is the device that's in the LSST array. Um, and it is very thick. It's 150 microns thick, so it has good resonance of sensitivity. But it's not so thick that you don't get a poor PSF. Um, and it's in a four-side buttable package. So this is a, this is a rather, rather delicate package. Um, there's nothing around the edges. If you handle this poorly, you get a broken sensor. Um, so yeah, that, that one's, that one's uh, is, I think we've made a couple of hundred of those for LSST. So it has about 20 to 25% QE at 1,000. Um, but as I said, there's that trade-off between PSF. Um, great thickness, you get more red, but it doesn't work quite as well. So moving on further into the, into the red, this is our friends over in uh, TIS. So the Hawaii... 4RG10, this one is. So this is, this is a slide that has been <coughs> stolen from Jim Belatech. And it will show you kind of... I, I, I remember hearing about Hawaii and I didn't know what any of the letters meant. Um, but it's H, HG, Mercad Tel, <coughs> Astronomical Wide Area Infrared Imager. Conveniently, Hawaii. I thought they were made in Hawaii to start off with, but it turns out they're not. Um, and it's substrate removed, CAD, Merck CAD tel. Um, so you can, you can see in the visible and you can see in the IR. Um, and it's bump bonded um, to a CMOS ROIC. So it, this could have the same kind of capabilities of simultaneous readout, etc., that um, monolithic CMOS um, on silicon could have. So, um, in fact, they do build a silicon version of this. Um, called high visi um, so that if, if you just want to drag and drop <coughs> silicon or infrared materials you can you can do that um, so there's another newer sensor that's coming out so this is 4k um, 10 micron pixels but they have a new one coming up um, or, or released already um, that is 15 micron 4k by 4k so this is this is the largest mercad tail sensor in the world at the moment 
Um, so there's some that, that will be going on to ESO, there's, there's some that's gone to the Subaru telescope, um, and conveniently some on Hawaii, which is, which is really nice. Um, and that's it. Any questions? mentioned these um, multiple readout areas. Yes. Can you read out at different speeds as well? Um, I wouldn't have thought so, no. Um, I, I think it would be quite tricky to... Because you have, you have to do your resets at, at certain times, and sometimes in certain modes there will be a global reset. Um, so it, it, maybe if you had full control over the sequencer on some of the chips. But, for example, the SIS120 has a built-in sequencer. So unless it was built in... You can't then do it. Um, potentially on some of them, but it would all depend how, you, how cleverly you drove your, your chip. Um, yes, for simple CMOS, I'm pretty sure you could do. Um, but on these more inbuilt, where everything, everything's digital on chip, I doubt we could do it at the moment. I don't think we've had any interest in doing that before. So I don't know, I'll ask, I'll ask the designers. <laughs> ask another question. Um, and I noticed the, there's 14 bit. You flashed up the slide. Is the, um, the CMOS available in 16 bit? Not that one, no. Um, I mean, I'm sure you could non destructively read out several times and get that kind of resolution, but it isn't inbuilt into the chip. So there are several things you can do on, on CMOS chips. So you could read it multiple times um, and then average the solution and then out, output after. A slightly higher bit, but again, that affects your, your frame rate. So, for space applications, ESA, NASA, etc., they care about TRL technology. They do, yes. Level. Um, what level are the CMOS ones at? They must be reasonably high if they're for the Euclid ones, at least. Um, yes, I don't know exactly what TRL level they are, but I mean, we are. We've got some CIS one one fives that will be going on the Juice mission. So they are, they are going to be launched. Um, so there is a decent amount of maturity in terms of the radiation hardness on these things. Definitely. Okay, can we thank our speaker again? <laughs>